1. Sojourner Truth, 1797 to 1887. Sojourner Truth, born 1797, Ulster County, New York, U.S., died November 26, 1883, Battle Creek, Michigan. Truth was born Isabella Bomfrey, a slave in Dutch-speaking Ulster County, New York, in 1797. She was bought and sold four times and subjected to harsh physical labor and violent punishments. In her teens, she was united with another slave with whom she had five children beginning in 1815. In 1827 a year before New York's law freeing slaves was to take effect Truth ran away with her infant Sophia to a nearby abolitionist family the Van Vogeners. The family bought her freedom for $20 and helped Truth successfully sue for the return of her five-year-old son Peter who was illegally sold into slavery in Alabama. In 1828 Truth moved to New York City, where she worked for a local minister. By the early 1830s, she participated in the religious revivals that were sweeping the state and became a charismatic speaker. In 1843 she declared that the Spirit called on her to preach the truth renaming herself Sojourner Truth. As an itinerant preacher Truth met abolitionists William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Garrison's anti-slavery organization encouraged Truth to give speeches about the evils of slavery. She never learned to read or write. In 1850 she dictated what would become her autobiography The Narrative of Sojourner Truth to Olive Gilbert, who assisted in its publication. Truth survived on sales of the book, which also brought her national recognition. She met women's rights activists, including Elizabeth, Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony as well as temperance advocates, both causes she quickly championed. In 1851 Truth began a lecture tour that included a women's rights conference in Akron, Ohio, where she delivered her famous, Ain't I a Woman, speech. In it she challenged prevailing notions of racial and gender inferiority and inequality by reminding listeners of her combined strength, Truth was nearly six feet tall, and female status. Truth ultimately split with Douglas, who believed suffrage for formerly enslaved men should come before women's suffrage she thought both should occur simultaneously. During the 1850s Truth settled in Battle Creek, Michigan where three of her daughters lived. She continued speaking nationally and helped slaves escape to freedom. When the Civil War started Truth urged young men to join the Union cause and organized supplies for black troops. After the war, she was honored with an invitation to the White House and became involved with the Freedmen's Bureau, helping freed slaves find jobs and build new lives. While in Washington, D.C., she lobbied against segregation. In the mid-1860s, when a streetcar conductor tried to violently block her from riding she ensured his arrest and won her subsequent case. In 1864 went to Washington, D.C., where she helped integrate streetcars and was received at the White House by President Abraham Lincoln. The same year, she accepted an appointment with the National Freedmen's Relief Association counseling former slaves particularly in matters of resettlement. As late as the 1870s, she encouraged the migration of freedmen to Kansas and Missouri. In 1875, she retired to her home in Battle Creek, where she remained until her death. In 1862 American sculptor William Wetmore Story completed a marble statue inspired by Sojourner Truth named the Libyan Sybil. The work won an award at the London World Exhibition. The original sculpture was gifted to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City by the Irving Wolf Foundation in 1978. A memorial bust of Truth was unveiled in 2009 in Emancipation Hall in the U.S. Capitol Visitor Center. She is the first African-American woman to have a statue in the Capitol building. In 2014 Truth was included in Smithsonian Magazine's list of the 100 most significant Americans of all time. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. If women want any rights more than they scot why don't they just take them and not be talking about it. Sojourner Truth with Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. House of Colonel Johannes Hardenberg. 2. Harriet Tubman, 1822 to 1913. Harriet Tubman, born Araminta Ross March, 1822, March 10, 1913 was an American abolitionist and social activist. After escaping slavery Tubman made some 13 missions to rescue approximately 70 enslaved people, including her family and friends using the network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses known collectively as the Underground Railroad. During the American Civil War she served as an armed scout and spy for the Union Army. In her later years, Tubman was an activist in the movement for women's suffrage. 
Born into slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland, Tubman was beaten and whipped by enslavers as a child. Early in life, she suffered a traumatic head wound when an irate overseer threw a heavy metal weight, intending to hit another slave, but hit her instead. The injury caused dizziness, pain and spells of hypersomnia, which occurred throughout her life. After her injury, Tubman began experiencing strange visions and vivid dreams, which she ascribed to premonitions from God. These experiences, combined with her Methodist upbringing, led her to become devoutly religious. In 1849, Tubman escaped to Philadelphia, only to return to Maryland to rescue her family soon after. Slowly one group at a time, she brought relatives with her out of the state, and eventually guided dozens of other enslaved people to freedom. Tubman, or Moses, as she was called, traveled by night and in extreme secrecy, and later said she never lost a passenger. After the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed, she helped guide escapees farther north into British North America, Canada, and helped newly freed people find work. Tubman met John Brown in 1858 and helped him plan and recruit supporters for his 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry. When the Civil War began, Tubman worked for the Union Army, first as a cook and nurse, and then as an armed scout and spy. For her guidance of the raid at Combahee Ferry, which liberated more than 700 enslaved people, she is widely credited as first woman to lead an armed expedition in the war. After the war, she retired to the family home on property she had purchased in 1859 in Auburn, New York, where she cared for her aging parents. She was active in the women's suffrage movement until illness overtook her, and she had to be admitted to a home for elderly African Americans that she had helped to establish years earlier. She became an icon of courage and freedom. I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had the right to, liberty or death, if I could have one I would have the other. In 1978, Tubman became the first African American woman honored on a US postage stamp. She appeared on a second stamp in 1995. Beginning in 2016, there have been plans to add a portrait of Tubman to the front of the $20 bill, moving the portrait of President Andrew Jackson, a slaveholder, to the back of the bill. In 2024, the United States Mint issued three commemorative coins featuring Tubman. Each coin depicts Tubman at a different stage of her life. Dozens of schools, streets and highways, church groups, social organizations, and government agencies have been named after Tubman. In 1944, the United States Maritime Commission launched the SS Harriet Tubman, its first liberty ship named for a black woman. Worked for slavery's abolition alongside Tubman, a woodcut of Tubman in her Civil War clothing. Formal portrait of Tubman taken after the Civil War. Tubman in 1887, far left, with her husband Davis seated, with Kane, their adopted daughter Gertie, beside Tubman, Lee Cheney John Pop Alexander, Walter Green, blind Auntie Sarah Parker, and her great niece Dora Stewart at Tubman's home in Auburn, New York. 3. Ida Wells, 1862-1931. Ida Bell Wells Barnett, July 16, 1862 to March 25, 1931, was an American investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. She was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP. Wells dedicated her career to combating prejudice and violence, and advocating for African American equality especially that of women. Throughout the 1890s, Wells documented lynching in the United States in articles and through pamphlets, such as Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases, and The Red Record, which debunked the fallacy frequently voiced by whites at the time that all black lynching victims were guilty of crimes. Wells exposed the brutality of lynching, and analyzed its sociology, arguing that whites used lynching to terrorize African Americans in the South, because they represented economic and political competition, and thus a threat of loss of power for whites. She aimed to demonstrate the truth about this violence, and advocate for measures to stop it. Wells was born into slavery in Holly Springs, Mississippi. At the age of 14, she lost both her parents and her infant brother in the 1878 yellow fever epidemic. She went to work and kept the rest of the family together with the help of her grandmother. Later, moving with some of her siblings to Memphis, Tennessee, Wells found better pay as a teacher. Soon Wells co-owned and wrote for the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight newspaper, where her reporting covered incidents of racial segregation and inequality. Eventually, her investigative journalism was carried nationally in black-owned newspapers, subjected to continued threats and criminal violence including when a white mob destroyed her newspaper office and presses, Wells left Memphis for Chicago, Illinois. She married Ferdinand L. Barnett in 1895 and had a family while continuing her work writing, speaking and organizing for civil rights, 
and the women's movement for the rest of her life. On October 26, 1892, Wells began to publish her research on lynching in a pamphlet titled Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. After conducting further research, Wells published the Red Record, in 1895 a 100-page pamphlet with more detail, describing lynching in the United States, since the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. It also covered black people's struggles in the South since the Civil War. The Red Record explored the alarmingly high rates of lynching in the United States, which was at a peak from 1880 to 1930. Wells said that during Reconstruction, most Americans outside the South did not realize the growing rate of violence against black people in the South. She believed that during slavery, white people had not committed as many attacks because of the economic labor value of slaves. Wells noted that, since slavery time, 10,000 Negroes have been killed in cold blood, through lynching, without the formality of judicial trial and legal execution. After a year of ill health, Wells died of kidney disease on the 25th of March, 1931 in Chicago. She was 68. In her later years, she had become overshadowed by more moderate voices in the orthodox civil rights and women's suffrage movement. Awards have been established in her name by the National Association of Black Journalists, the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, the Coordinating Council for Women in History, the Type Investigations, or formerly the Investigative Fund, the University of Louisville and the New York County Lawyers Association, awarded annually since 2003, among many others. The Ida B. Wells Memorial Foundation and the Ida B. Wells Museum have also been established to protect, preserve and promote Wells' legacy. In her hometown of Holly Springs, Mississippi, there is an Ida B. Wells Barnett Museum named in her honor that acts as a cultural center of African-American history. In 1988, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In August that year, she was also inducted into the Chicago Women's Hall of Fame. Molefi Key to Sonti included Wells on his list of 100 Greatest African Americans in 2002. In 2011, Wells was inducted into the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame for her writings. On February 1, 1990, at the start of Black History Month in the U.S., the U.S. Postal Service dedicated a 25-cent stamp commemorating Wells in a ceremony at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. The stamp, designed by Thomas Blackshee II, features a portrait of Wells illustrated from a composite of photographs of her taken during the mid-1890s. Wells is the 25th African-American entry and 4th African-American woman on a U.S. postage stamp. She is the 13th in the Postal Service's Black Heritage Series. In 2020 was honored with a Pulitzer Prize special citation for her outstanding and courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious violence against African Americans during the era of lynching. It is with no pleasure that I have dipped my hands in the corruption here exposed. Somebody must show that the Afro-American race is more sinned against than sinning, and it seems to have fallen upon me to do so. Attorney Ferdinand Lee Barnett, Wells married Barnett in 1895. The Wells family lived in a shack behind this house, while enslaved by its owner, Spires Bolling. Wells with her four children, 1909. Grave marker for Ida B. Wells and her husband Ferdinand at Oakwood Cemetery. 4. Hattie McDaniel, 1895-1952. Hattie McDaniel, June 10, 1893 to October 26, 1952, was an American actress, singer-songwriter, and comedian. For her role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind, 1939, she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress, becoming the first African-American to win an Oscar. She has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame in 1975, and in 2006 became the first Black Oscar winner honored with a U.S. postage stamp. In 2010, she was inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. In addition to acting, McDaniel recorded 16 blues sides between 1926 and 1929 and was a radio performer and television personality. She was the first black woman to sing on radio in the United States. Although she appeared in more than 300 films, she received on-screen credits for only 83. Her best-known other major films are Alice Adams, In This Our Life, Since You Went Away, and Song of the South. McDaniel experienced racism and racial segregation throughout her career, and was unable to attend the premiere of Gone with the Wind in Atlanta, because it was held at a whites-only theater. At the Oscar ceremony in Los Angeles, she sat at a segregated table at the side of the room. In 1952, McDaniel died of breast cancer. 
Her final wish to be buried in Hollywood Cemetery was denied because the graveyard was restricted to whites only at the time. She made her last film appearances in Mickey, 1948, and Family Honeymoon, 1949, where that same year she appeared on the live CBS television program, The Edwin Show. She remained active on radio and television in her final years, becoming the first black actor to star in her own radio show with the comedy series Beulah. She also starred in the television version of the show, replacing Ethel Waters after the first season. Waters had apparently expressed concerns over stereotypes in the role. Beulah was a hit, and earned McDaniel $2,000 per week, however, the show was controversial. The 12th Academy Awards took place at Coconut Grove Restaurant of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. It was preceded by a banquet in the same room. Luella Parsons, an American gossip columnist, reported about Oscar Knight, writing on February 29, 1940. Patty McDaniel earned that gold Oscar by her fine performance of Mammy in Gone with the Wind. If you had seen her face when she walked up to the platform and took the gold trophy, you would have had the choke in your voice that all of us had when Hattie, hair trimmed with gardenias, face alight, and dress up to the Queen's taste, accepted the honor in one of the finest speeches ever given on the Academy floor. A 1939 publicity photo for Gone with the Wind including McDaniel, Olivia de Havilland, and Vivian Lee. McDaniel as Beulah in August 1951 a year before her death. From McDaniel's acceptance speech, 12th Annual Academy Awards February 29, 1940. Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Fellow Members of the Motion Picture Industry and Honored Guests. This is one of the happiest moments of my life, and I want to thank each one of you, who had a part in selecting me for one of their awards, for your kindness. It has made me feel very very humble, and I shall always hold it as a beacon for anything that I may be able to do in the future. I sincerely hope, I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel, and may I say thank you and God bless you. In August 1950, McDaniel entered the hospital with a heart ailment. She was released in October to recuperate at home, and was reported on January 3, 1951, as showing slight improvement in her recovery from a mild stroke. She died of breast cancer on October 26, 1952, in the hospital of the Motion Picture House in Woodland Hills, California. She was survived by her brother Sam McDaniel. Thousands of mourners turned out to celebrate her life and achievements. McDaniel Cenotaph at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. 5. Rosa Parks, 1913-2005 Rosa Louise Macaulay Parks, February 4, 1913 to October 24, 2005, was an American activist in the civil rights movement best known for her pivotal role in the Montgomery bus boycott. The United States Congress has honored her as the First Lady of Civil Rights and the mother of the freedom movement. Parks became an NAACP activist in 1943, participating in several high-profile civil rights campaigns. On December 1, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Parks rejected bus driver James F. Blake's order to vacate a row of four seats in the colored section in favor of a white passenger, once the white section was filled. Parks was not the first person to resist bus segregation, but the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People NAACP, believed that she was the best candidate for seeing through court challenge after her arrest for civil disobedience in violating Alabama segregation laws, and she helped inspire the black community to boycott the Montgomery buses for over a year. The case became bogged down in the state courts, but the federal Montgomery bus lawsuit Browder v. Gale resulted in a November 1956 decision that bus segregation is unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Parks's act of defiance and the Montgomery bus boycott became important symbols of the movement. She became an international icon of resistance to racial segregation and organized and collaborated with civil rights leaders, including Edgar Nixon and Martin Luther King Jr. at the time. Parks was employed as a seamstress at a local department store and was secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. She had recently attended the Highlander Folk School, a Tennessee center for training activists for workers' rights and racial equality. Although widely honored in later years, she also suffered for her act. She was fired from her job and received death threats for years afterwards. Shortly after the boycott, she moved to Detroit where she briefly found similar work. From 1965 to 1988, 
She served as secretary and receptionist to John Cunius, an African-American U.S. representative. She was also active in the Black Power movement and the support of political prisoners in the U.S. After retirement, Parks wrote her autobiography and continued to insist that there was more work to be done in the struggle for justice. Parks received national recognition, including the NAACP's 1979 Spingorn Medal, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, and a posthumous statue in the United States Capitol's National Statuary Hall. Upon her death in 2005, she was the first woman to lie in honor in the Capitol Rotunda. California and Missouri commemorate Rosa Parks Day on her birthday, February 4, while Ohio, Oregon, and Texas commemorate the anniversary of her arrest, December 1. Parks died of natural causes on October 24, 2005, at the age of 92, in her apartment on the east side of Detroit. She and her husband never had children and she outlived her only sibling. She was survived by her sister-in-law, Raymond's sister, 13 nieces and nephews and their families, and several cousins, most of them residents of Michigan or Alabama. According to Parks's autobiography, I was not tired physically, or no more tired than I usually was at the end of a working day. I was not old, although some people have an image of me as being old then. I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. The American Public Transportation Association declared December 1, 2005, the 50th anniversary of her arrest, to be a national transit tribute to Rosa Parks Day. In 1979, the NAACP awarded Parks the Spingorn Medal, its highest honor. In 1980, she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Award. In 1982, California State University, Fresno, awarded Parks the African American Achievement Award. The honor, given to deserving students in succeeding years, became the Rosa Parks Awards. In 1983, she was inducted into Michigan Women's Hall of Fame for her achievements in civil rights. In 1984, she received a Candace Award from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. In 2018 continuing the conversation, a public sculpture of Parks was unveiled on the main campus of the Georgia Institute of Technology. In 2019 a statue of Rosa Parks was unveiled in Montgomery, Alabama. In 2021 on January 20, a bust of Rosa Parks by Artis Lane was added to the Oval Office when Joe Biden began his presidency. The sculpture is currently displayed next to Augustus St. Gordon's bust of Abraham Lincoln. Parks being fingerprinted on February 22, 1956, when she was arrested again, along with 73 other people, after a grand jury indicted 113 African Americans for organizing the Montgomery bus boycott. The Rosa Parks Congressional Gold Medal Parks and U.S. President Bill Clinton U.S. President Barack Obama sitting on the bus Parks was arrested sitting in the same row Obama is in, but on the opposite side. A plaque entitled, The Bus Stop at Dexter Avenue and Montgomery Street The Place Rosa Parks boarded the bus pays tribute to her and the success of the Montgomery bus boycott. The number 2857 bus on which Parks was riding before her arrest, a GM, Old Look, Transit Bus Serial Number 1132, is now a museum exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum. Rosa Parks Railway Station in Paris Rosa Parks statue by Eugene Daub, 2013, in National Statuary Hall United States Capitol. Compelling Autobiography Rosa Parks talks candidly about the civil rights movement and her active role in it. Her dedication is inspiring, her story is unforgettable. This book offers a revealing look at Rosa Parks, whose role as an activist and struggle with racism began long before her historic 1955 Montgomery, Alabama, bus ride. 6. Daisy Bates, 1914-1999 Daisy Bates November 11, 1914 to November 4, 1999, was an American civil rights activist, publisher, journalist, and lecturer, who played a leading role in the Little Rock integration crisis of 1957. Daisy Bates was born on November 11, 1914, to her father Hezekiah Gatson and her mother Millie Riley. She grew up in southern Arkansas in the small sawmill town of Huttig. Hezekiah Gatson supported the family by working as a lumber grader in a local mill. 
Her mother Millie Riley was murdered when Daisy was an infant and the girl was given care to her mother's close friends. In the death of my mother, Bates recounted learning at the age of eight that her birth mother had been raped and murdered by three local white men, and her body thrown into a mill pond, where it was later discovered. Learning that no one was prosecuted for her mother's murder stoked Daisy's anger about injustice. Her adoptive father, Orly Smith, told her that the killers were never found and that the police showed little interest in the case. Daisy wanted vengeance. She later wrote, My life now had a secret goal, to find the men who had done this horrible thing to my mother. She eventually identified one of her mother's killers. At a commissary, she stumbled upon a gaze from a young white man that would imply that he was involved. After this interaction, Daisy would go there often to belittle the drunken man with just her eyes. The young man later pleaded with Daisy, in the name of God, please leave me alone. He drank himself to death and was found in an alleyway. She began to hate white people. Out of concern and hope, her adoptive father gave her some advice from his deathbed. You're filled with hatred. Hate can destroy you, Daisy. Don't hate white people just because they are white. If you hate, make it count for something. Hate the humiliations we are living under in the South. Hate the discrimination that eats away at the South. Hate the discrimination that eats away at the soul of every black man and woman. Hate the insults hurled at us by white scum and then try to do something about it or your hate won't spell a thing. Bates said she had never forgotten that. She believed that this memory supported her strength for leadership in the cause of civil rights. Daisy was 17 when she started dating Lucius Christopher Bates, an insurance salesman who had also worked on newspapers in the South and West. Daisy was only 15 years old when they first met, and Lucius was still married to Cassandra Crawford. Lucius divorced his first wife in 1941, before moving to Little Rock and starting the Arkansas State Press. Daisy and Elsie Bates married on March 4, 1942. In 1952, Daisy Bates was elected president of the Arkansas Conference of NAACP branches. After their move to Little Rock, the Bateses decided to act on a dream of theirs, the ownership of a newspaper. They leased a printing plant that belonged to a church publication and inaugurated the Arkansas State Press, a weekly statewide newspaper. The first issue appeared on May 9, 1941. Throughout its existence, the Arkansas State Press covered all social news happening within the state. It was an avid supporter of racial integration in schools and thoroughly publicized its support in its pages. In 1957, because of its strong position during the Little Rock segregation crisis, white advertisers held another boycott to punish the newspaper for supporting desegregation. This boycott successfully cut off funding, except the money which came directly and through advertisements from the NAACP national office and through ads from supporters throughout the country. Despite this the state press was unable to maintain itself and the last issue was published on October 29, 1959. Daisy Bates immediately joined the local branch of the NAACP upon moving to Little Rock. In an interview she explains her history with the organization and that all her dreams were tied with this organization. Her father was a member of the NAACP many years before and she recounts asking him why he joined the organization. She said her father would bring her back literature to read and after learning of their goals she decided to dedicate herself to. Bates became president of the Arkansas Conference of Branches in 1952 at the age of 38. She remained active and was on the national board of the NAACP until 1970. Due to her position in NAACP, Bates' personal life was threatened much of the time. In her autobiography, Bates discussed her life as a president of the NAACP in Arkansas. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled segregated schools unconstitutional. After the ruling Bates began gathering African-American students to enroll at all white schools. Often the white schools refused to let black students attend. Bates used her newspaper to publicize the schools who did follow the federal mandate. Despite the continuous rejection from many Arkansas public schools, she pushed forward. When the national NAACP office started to focus on Arkansas schools, they looked to Bates to plan the strategy. She took the reins and organized the Little Rock Nine. 
Bates selected nine students to integrate Central High School in Little Rock in 1957. She regularly drove the students to school and worked tirelessly to ensure they were protected from violent crowds. She also advised the group and even joined the school's parent organization. Due to Bates' role in the integration, she was often a target for intimidation. Rocks were thrown into her home several times, and she received bullet shells in the mail. The threats forced the Bates family to shut down their newspaper. After the success of the Little Rock Nine, Bates continued to work on improving the status of African Americans in the South. Her influential work with school integration brought her national recognition. In 1962, she published her memoirs, The Long Shadow of Little Rock. Eventually, the book would win an American Book Award. Bates was invited to sit on the stage during the program at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. Due to a last-minute change, Bates was invited to speak at the march. Bates then moved to Washington, D.C., and worked for the Democratic National Committee. She also served in the administration of U.S. President Lyndon Baines Johnson working on anti-poverty programs. In 1965, she had a stroke and returned to Little Rock. In 1968, she moved to the rural black community of Mitchellville in Desha County, Eastern Arkansas. She concentrated on improving the lives of her neighbors by establishing a self-help program, which was responsible for new sewer systems, paved streets, a water system, and community center. Bates revived the Arkansas State Press in 1984 after L. C. Bates, her husband, died in 1980. In the same year, Bates also earned the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree, which was awarded by the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. In 1986 the University of Arkansas Press republished The Long Shadow of Little Rock, which became the first reprinted edition ever to earn an American Book Award. The former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote the introduction for Bates' autobiography. The following year she sold the newspaper, but continued to act as a consultant. Little Rock paid perhaps the ultimate tribute, not only to Bates, but to the new era she helped initiate, by opening Daisy Bates Elementary School, and by making the third Monday in February George Washington's birthday, and Daisy Gatson Bates Day an official state holiday. Bates died following a series of strokes, in Little Rock on November 4, 1999, a week before her 85th birthday. For her work, the state of Arkansas proclaimed the third Monday in February, Daisy Gatson Bates Day. She was posthumously awarded the Medal of Freedom in 1999. Filmmaker Sharon La Cruz produced and directed a documentary film about Bates. Daisy Bates, First Lady of Little Rock premiered on February 2, 2012, as part of the Independent Lens series on PBS. 1988 American Book Award, Honorary Doctor of Laws Degree, University of Arkansas, 1984. Candice Award from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, 1984. Arkansas has established the third Monday in February as George Washington's birthday and Daisy Gatson Bates Day, an official state holiday. Congressional Gold Medal posthumously awarded by President Bill Clinton along with other members of the Little Rock Nine in November, 1999. 7. Eugenia Charles, 1917-2005 Mary Eugenia Charles, the 15th of May, 1919-6th to the 6th of September, 2005, was a Dominican politician, who was Prime Minister of Dominica from the 21st of July, 1980, until the 14th of June, 1995. The first female lawyer in Dominica, she was Dominica's first, and to date only female Prime Minister. She was the second female Prime Minister, in the Caribbean, after Lucina D. A. Costa of the Netherlands Antilles. She was the first female in the Americas to be elected in her own right as head of government. She served for the second longest period of any Dominican prime minister, and was the world's fourth longest serving female prime minister, behind Sheikh Hasina of Bangladesh, Siramavo Bandranaik of Sri Lanka, and Indira Gandhi of India. She was also described as the Iron Lady of the Caribbean. Eugenia Charles was born on the 15th of May, 1919, in the fishing village of Point Michel, in St. Luke Parish, Dominica. She was the daughter of John Baptiste Charles and Josephine Charles, née Delaunay, the youngest of four children. Six of her family was considered part of the colored bourgeoisie, descendants of free people of color. Her father was a mason who became a wealthy landowner and had business interests in export-import. She passed the bar and returned to Dominica, where she became the island's first female lawyer. She established a practice specializing in property law, she served as president of the Dominica Bar Association during the 1970s. She also worked as a director of the Dominican Cooperative Bank 
which had been established by her father, and instituted the country's first student loan scheme. Charles never married nor had children. In 1991, she was made a Dane commander of the Order of the British Empire. Charles began campaigning in politics during the 1960s against restrictions on press freedom. She wrote anonymous newspaper columns for the Herald and the Star criticizing the Dominica Labour Party government. In 1967, she became involved in the Freedom Fighters, an advocacy group which opposed the Seditious and Undesirable Publications Act. In October 1968, the group merged with the National Democratic Movement of Dominica to become the Dominica Freedom Party DFP. The party held its first convention in June 1969 and Charles was appointed as its leader, a position she would hold until 1995. Charles became Prime Minister when the DFP swept the 1980 general election, the party's first electoral victory. She took over from Oliver Serafin, who had taken over only the year before, when mass protests had forced the country's first Prime Minister, Patrick John, to step down from office. Her first term was focused on rebuilding infrastructure and disaster management as Hurricane David had hit Dominica on 29 August 1979. She additionally served as Dominica's foreign minister from 1980 to 1990, minister of finance from 1980 to 1995, and as chairperson of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. With popularity declining during her third term, Charles retired in 1995. The DFP subsequently lost the 1995 general election. After retiring, Charles undertook speaking engagements in the United States and abroad. She became involved in former U.S. President Jimmy Carter's Carter Center, which promotes human rights and observes elections to encourage fairness. On 30 August 2005, Charles entered a hospital in Fort de France, Martinique, for hip replacement surgery. She died from a pulmonary embolism on 6 September, at the age of 86. She was buried in Pointe Michel on 14 September. She received the award Golden Drum Award. Quotes by Eugeria Charles, men have the grand vision, and they pass it on to somebody else to put into practice. Women follow the details more. They want to know that it is being put into practice. 8. Coretta Scott King, 1927-2006. Coretta Scott King, April 27, 1927 to January 30, 2006, was an American author, activist, and civil rights leader, and the wife of Martin Luther King Jr. from 1953 until his death. As an advocate for African American equality, she was a leader for the civil rights movement in the 1960s. King was also a singer, who often incorporated music into her civil rights work. King met her husband while attending graduate school in Boston. They both became increasingly active in the American civil rights movement. King played a prominent role in the years after her husband's assassination, in 1968, when she took on the leadership of the struggle for racial equality herself, and became active in the women's movement. King founded the King Center, and sought to make his birthday a national holiday. She finally succeeded when Ronald Reagan signed legislation, which established Martin Luther King. Junior Day on November 2, 1983. She later broadened her scope to include both advocacy for LGBTQ rights and opposition to apartheid. King became friends with many politicians before and after Martin's death, including John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Robert F. Kennedy. Her telephone conversation with John F. Kennedy during the 1960 presidential election has been credited by historians for mobilizing African-American voters. In August 2005, King suffered a stroke which paralyzed her right side and left her unable to speak. Five months later, she died of respiratory failure due to complications from ovarian cancer. Her funeral was attended by some 10,000 people, including U.S. Presidents George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George H. W. Bush, and Jimmy Carter. She was temporarily buried on the grounds of the King Center until being interred next to her husband. She was inducted into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame, the National Women's Hall of Fame, and was the first African-American to lie in state at the Georgia State Capitol. King has been referred to as First Lady of the Civil Rights Movement. Coretta Scott was born in Heiberger, Alabama, the third of four children of Obadiah Scott, 1899-1998, and Bernice McMurray Scott, 1904-1996. She was born in her parents' home, with her paternal great-grandmother Delia Scott, a former slave, presiding as midwife. She was diagnosed with a heart condition and was discharged on her 78th and final birthday. Later, she suffered several small strokes. On August 16, 2005, 
She was hospitalized after suffering a stroke and a mild heart attack. Initially, she was unable to speak or move her right side. Due to continuing health problems, King cancelled a number of speaking and traveling engagements throughout the remainder of 2005. On January 14, 2006, Coretta made her last public appearance in Atlanta at a dinner honoring her husband's memory. On January 26, 2006, King checked into a rehabilitation center in Rosarito Beach, Mexico under a different name. Doctors did not learn her real identity until her medical records arrived the next day and did not begin treatment due to her condition. Coretta Scott King died on the late evening of January 30, 2006, at the rehabilitation center in Rosarito Beach, Mexico, in the Oasis Hospital, where she was undergoing holistic therapy for her stroke and advanced stage ovarian cancer. The main cause of her death is believed to be respiratory failure due to complications from ovarian cancer. In 1970, the American Library Association began awarding a medal named for Coretta Scott King to outstanding African-American writers and illustrators of children's literature. In 1978, Women's Way awarded King with their first Lucretia Mart Award for showing a dedication to the advancement of women and justice similar to Lucretia Marts. In 1983, she received the Four Freedoms Award for the Freedom of Worship. She received the Key of Life Award from the NAACP. In 1987, she received a Candace Award for Distinguished Service from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. In 1997, Coretta Scott King was the recipient of the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement. In 2004, Coretta Scott King was awarded the prestigious Gandhi Peace Prize by the Government of India. King with her husband and daughter Yolanda in 1956. Coretta Scott with her husband and Vice President-elect Hubert Humphrey on December 17, 1964. King comforting daughter Bernice at her husband's funeral, in a Pulitzer Prize-winning photo, by Moneta Sleet Jr. King attending the 1976 Democratic National Convention. Coretta Scott attends the signing of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, by President Ronald Reagan, on November 2, 1983. King poses next to a portrait of her husband in 2004. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King sarcophagus, within the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site. Coretta Scott King's Temporary 2006 Grave 9. Maya Angelou, 1928-2014 Maya Angelou, born Marguerite Annie Johnson April 4, 1928-May 28, 2014, was an American memoirist, poet, and civil rights activist. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, several books of poetry, and is credited with a list of plays, movies, and television shows spanning over 50 years. She received dozens of awards and more than 50 honorary degrees. Angelou's series of seven autobiographies focus on her childhood and early adult experiences. The first, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 1969, tells of her life up to the age of 17 and brought her international recognition and acclaim. She became a poet and writer after a string of odd jobs during her young adulthood. These included Fry Cook, sex worker, nightclub performer, Porgy and Bess cast member Southern Christian Leadership Conference coordinator, and correspondent in Egypt and Ghana during the decolonization of Africa. Angelou was also an actress, writer, director, and producer of plays, movies, and public television programs. In 1982, she was named the first Reynolds Professor of American Studies at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Angelou was active in the civil rights movement and worked with Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, beginning in the 1990s. She made approximately 80 appearances a year on the lecture circuit, something she continued into her 80s. In 1993, Angelou recited her poem, On the Pulse of Morning, 1993, at the first inauguration of Bill Clinton, making her the first poet to make an inaugural recitation since Robert Frost at the inauguration of John F. Kennedy in 1961. With the publication of I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, Angelou publicly discussed aspects of her personal life. She was respected as a spokesperson for black people and women, and her works have been considered a defense of black culture. Her works are widely used in schools and universities worldwide, although attempts have been made to ban her books from some U.S. libraries. Angelou's most celebrated works have been labeled as autobiographical fiction, but many critics consider them to be autobiographies. She made a deliberate attempt to challenge the common structure of the autobiography by critiquing, changing and expanding the genre. 
Her books center on themes including racism, identity, family and travel. Angelou died on the morning of May 28, 2014, at age 86. Although Angelou had been in poor health and had cancelled recent scheduled appearances, she was working on another book, an autobiography about her experiences with national and world leaders. Chronology of autobiographies, I know why the caged bird sings, 1969, up to 1944, age 17. Gather together in my name, 1974. Sinjin and Swingin and Gettin' Merry Like Christmas, 1976, 1949 to 55. The Heart of a Woman, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes, 1986, A Song Flung Up to Heaven, 2002, 1965 to 68. Mom and Me and Mom, 2013 Overview. Her honors included a Pulitzer Prize nomination for her book of poetry, Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water for IDI, a Tony Award nomination for her role in the 1973 play Look Away, and three Grammys for her spoken word albums. She served on two presidential committees, and was awarded the Spingorn Medal in 1994, the National Medal of Arts in 2000, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2011. Angelou was awarded more than 50 honorary degrees. In 2021, the United States Mint announced that Angelou would be among the first women depicted on the reverse of the quarter, as a part of the American Women Quarter series. The coins were released in January 2022. She is the first black woman to be depicted on a quarter. Angelou speaking at a rally for Barack Obama, 2008. Angelou and Hillary Clinton, at an event in North Carolina, in 2008. U.S. President Barack Obama presenting Angelou with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, 2011. 10. Shirley Chisholm, 1924 to 2005. Shirley Chisholm, born November 30, 1924, Brooklyn, New York, U.S. died January 1, 2005, Ormond Beach, Florida, was an American politician, the first African-American woman to be elected to the U.S. Congress. Shirley St. Hill was the daughter of immigrants. Her father was from British Guiana, now Guyana, and her mother from Barbados. She grew up in Barbados and in her native Brooklyn, New York and graduated from Brooklyn College, B.A., 1946, while teaching nursery school and serving as director of the Friends Day Nursery in Brooklyn. She studied elementary education at Columbia University, M.A., 1951, and married Conrad Q. Chisholm in 1949, divorced 1977. An education consultant for New York City's daycare division, she was also active with community and political groups, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP and her district's Unity Democratic Club. In 1964-68, she represented her Brooklyn district in the New York State Legislature. In 1968 Chisholm was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, defeating the civil rights leader James Farmer. In Congress, she quickly became known as a strong liberal who opposed weapons development and the war in Vietnam and favored full employment proposals. As a candidate for the Democratic nomination for U.S. President in 1972, she won 152 delegates before withdrawing from the race. Chisholm, a founder of the National Women's Political Caucus, supported the Equal Rights Amendment and legalized abortions throughout her congressional career, which lasted from 1969 to 1983. She wrote the autobiographical works Unbout and Unbossed, 1970, and The Good Fight, 1973. After her retirement from Congress, Chisholm remained active on the lecture circuit. She held the position of Purington Professor at Mount Holyoke College, 1983-87, and was a visiting scholar at Spelman College, 1985. In 1993, she was invited by President Bill Clinton to serve as ambassador to Jamaica, but declined because of poor health. Chisholm was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. Chisholm died on January 1, 2005, at her home in Ormond Beach, Florida, her health had been in decline after she had suffered a series of small strokes the previous summer. At her funeral, held in Palm Coast, Florida, the minister said that Chisholm had brought about change because she showed up, she stood up and she spoke up. She is buried in the Birchwood Mausoleum at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, where the legend inscribed on her vault reads, Unbout and Unboss. Presidential Medal of Freedom, posthumously awarded by President Barack Obama at a ceremony in the White House, November 2015.
William L. Dawson Award by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, 1982. In 1974, Chisholm was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree by Aquinas College and was their commencement speaker. In 1975, Chisholm was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree by Smith College. In 1981, Chisholm was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree by Mount Holyoke College. In 1996, she was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree by Stetson University in DeLand, Florida. Chisholm wrote two autobiographies, Chisholm, Shirley, 1970, Unbout and Unbossed Houghton Mifflin, Chisholm, Shirley, 2010, Scott Simpson, Unbout and Unbossed, Expanded 40th Anniversary Edition, Take Root Media, Chisholm, Shirley, 1973, The Good Fight, Harper Collins, Chisholm, Seated, Second from Right, with fellow founding members of the Congressional Black Caucus in 1971, Shirley Chisholm, 1972 Presidential Campaign Poster, Chisholm at the 1984 Democratic National Convention, Shirley Chisholm, Center, with Representative Adolphus Towns, Left, and his wife, Gwen Towns, Right. 11. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, 1938. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, born Ellen Eugenia Johnson, the 29th of October, 1938 is a Liberian politician, who served as the 24th President of Liberia from 2006 to 2018. Sirleaf was the first elected female head of state in Africa. Sirleaf was born in Monrovia to a Gola father and crew German mother. She was educated at the College of West Africa. She completed her education in the United States, where she studied at Madison Business College, the University of Colorado Boulder, and Harvard University. She returned to Liberia to work in William Tolbert's government as Deputy Minister of Finance from 1971 to 1974. Later, she worked again in the West, for the World Bank in the Caribbean and Latin America. In 1979, she received a cabinet appointment as Minister of Finance, serving to 1980. After Samuel Doe seized power in 1980 in a coup d'etat and executed Tolbert, Sirleaf fled to the United States. She worked for Citibank and then the Equator Bank. She returned to Liberia to contest a senatorial seat for Monserrado County in 1985, an election that was disputed. She was arrested as a result of her open criticism of the military government in 1985 and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, although she was later released. Sirleaf continued to be involved in politics. She finished in second place at the 1997 presidential election, which was won by Charles Taylor. She won the 2005 presidential election and took office on the 16th of January 2006. She was re-elected in 2011. She was the first woman in Africa elected as president of her country. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 in recognition of her efforts to bring women into the peacekeeping process. She has received numerous other awards for her leadership. In June 2016, Sirleaf was elected as the chair of the Economic Community of West African States, making her the first woman to hold the position since it was created. In 2011, Sirleaf was jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with Leigh McBowie of Liberia and Tawakal Kaman of Yemen. The three women were recognized for their non-violent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peacebuilding work. Sirleaf was conferred the Indira Gandhi Prize by Indian President Pranob Mukherjee on 12 September 2013. In 2016, she was listed as the 83rd most powerful woman in the world by Forbes magazine. As of 2014, she is listed as the 70th most powerful woman in the world by Forbes. In 2017, she was awarded a title in the Nigerian chieftaincy system by E. Samuel Ohiri of IMO, Nigeria. As a result, she is now the Ada D. I. O. Hanma of Iqbaland. 2017, she was recognized as one of the BBC's 100 Women of 2017. 2018 won the 2017 version of the Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership. Sir Leaf campaigning in Monrovia in 2005, shortly before she was elected, from left to right, to Wackel Carmen, Leigh McBowie, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf display their awards during the presentation of the Nobel Peace Prize the 10th of December 2011. Sirleaf at her inauguration in Monrovia. President Sirleaf addressing the 2008 General Conference of the United Methodist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. 
2012, Wang Arimathai, 1940-2011, Wang Arimathai, born April 1, 1940, Nairi, Kenya, died September 25, 2011, Nairobi, Kenyan politician, and environmental activist, who was awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize for Peace, becoming the first black African woman to win a Nobel Prize. Her work was often considered both unwelcome and subversive in her own country, where her outspokenness constituted stepping far outside traditional gender roles. Mathai was educated in the United States at Mount St. Scholastica College, now Benedictine College, BS in Biology, 1964, and at the University of Pittsburgh, MS, 1966. In 1971, she received a PhD at the University of Nairobi, effectively becoming the first woman in either East or Central Africa to earn a doctorate. She began teaching in the Department of Veterinary Anatomy at the University of Nairobi after graduation, and in 1977, she became chair of the department. While working with the National Council of Women of Kenya, Mathai developed the idea that village women could improve the environment by planting trees to provide a fuel source and to slow the processes of deforestation and decertification. The Green Belt Movement, an organization she founded in 1977, had by the early 21st century planted some 30 million trees. Leaders of the Green Belt Movement established the Pan-African Green Belt Network in 1986 in order to educate world leaders about conservation and environmental improvement. As a result of the movement's activism, similar initiatives were begun in other African countries, including Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe. In addition to her conservation work, Mathai was also an advocate for human rights, AIDS prevention, and women's issues, and she frequently represented these concerns at meetings of the United Nations General Assembly. She was elected to Kenya's National Assembly in 2002 with 98% of the vote, and in 2003 she was appointed Assistant Minister of Environment, Natural Resources, and Wildlife. When she won the Nobel Prize in 2004, the committee commended her holistic approach to sustainable development that embraces democracy, human rights, and women's rights in particular. Her first book, The Green Belt Movement, Sharing the Approach and the Experience, 1988, Revision Edition 2003, detailed the history of the organization. She published an autobiography, Unbowed, in 2007. Another volume, The Challenge for Africa, 2009, criticized Africa's leadership as ineffectual and urged Africans to try to solve their problems without Western assistance. Mathai was a frequent contributor to international publications, such as the Los Angeles Times and The Guardian. Mathai died of complications from ovarian cancer on the 25th of September 2011. Wanga Mathai was awarded the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize for her contribution to sustainable development, democracy and peace. Mathai was the first African woman to win the prestigious award, 1984, Right Livelihood Award 1987, Global 500 Roll of Honor, 1991, Goldman Environmental Prize, 2006, Legion D. Hunya, 2006, Doctor of Public Service, Honorary Degree, University of Pittsburgh, 2007, World Citizenship Award, 2007, Indira Gandhi Prize, 2020, the Perfect World Award by the Perfect World Foundation. Mathai in Nairobi with Chancellor of the Exchequer and later Prime Minister Gordon Brown in 2005. Mathai and then US Senator Barack Obama in Nairobi in 2006. 13. Oprah Winfrey, 1954. Oprah Gail Winfrey born Oprah Gail Winfrey January 29, 1954 also known mononymously as Oprah, is an American talk show host, television producer, actress, author, and media proprietor. She is best known for her talk show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, broadcast from Chicago, which ran in national syndication for 25 years, from 1986 to 2011. The queen of all media, she was the richest African American of the 20th century and was once the world's only black billionaire by 2007, she was often ranked as the most influential woman in the world. Winfrey was born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a single teenage mother and later raised in inner city Milwaukee. She has stated that she was molested during her childhood and early teenage years and became pregnant at 14. Her son was born prematurely and died in infancy. Winfrey was then sent to live with the man she calls her father, Vernon Winfrey, a barber in Nashville, Tennessee, and landed a job in radio while still in high school. 
By 19, she was a co-anchor for the local evening news. Winfrey's often emotional, extemporaneous delivery eventually led to her transfer to the daytime talk show arena, and after boosting a third-rated local Chicago talk show to first place, she launched her own production company. By the mid-1990s, Winfrey had reinvented her show with a focus on literature, self-improvement, mindfulness, and spirituality. Though she has been criticized for unleashing a confession culture, promoting controversial self-help ideas, and having an emotion-centered approach, she has also been praised for overcoming adversity to become a benefactor to others. Winfrey also emerged as a political force in the 2008 presidential race, with her endorsement of Barack Obama estimated to have been worth about 1 million votes during the 2008 Democratic primaries. In 2013, Winfrey was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama and received honorary doctorate degrees from Duke and Harvard. In 2008, she formed her own network, the Oprah Winfrey Network, OWN. Credited with creating a more intimate, confessional form of media communication, Winfrey popularized and revolutionized the tabloid talk show genre pioneered by Phil Donahue. In 1994, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Winfrey has won many accolades throughout her career, which includes 18 Daytime Emmy Awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award and the Chairman's Award, two Primetime Emmy Awards, including the Bob Hope Humanitarian Award, the Tony Award, a Peabody Award, and the Jean Herzholt Humanitarian Award awarded by the Academy Awards, in addition to two competitive Academy Award nominations. Winfrey was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. In 2011, received Academy Award I the category Jean Herzholt Humanitarian Award. In 2018, received Golden Globe Cecil B. DeMille Award for Lifetime Achievement Award. Honorary degrees from Princeton University, Howard University, Duke University, Harvard University, University of Massachusetts Lowell, 289, the University of the Free State, Tennessee State University, Spelman College, Colorado College, Smith College, Skidmore College. Winfrey on her, The Life You Want tour in October 2014. Winfrey celebrating her 50th birthday among friends at her Santa Barbara estate, 2004. Winfrey joins Barack and Michelle Obama on the campaign trail, December 10, 2007. Winfrey speaking at Moore's inauguration, 2023. Fourteen, Whoopi Goldberg, 1955. Whoopi Goldberg, born November 13, 1955, New York, U.S., American comedian, actress, and producer, who was an accomplished performer with a repertoire that ranged from dramatic leading roles to controversial comedic performances. She also garnered attention as a co-host of the TV talk show The View. Goldberg was the first black woman to win all four major North American Entertainment Awards, EGOT. Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. Goldberg spent her early years in a Manhattan housing project. She began performing at age eight with a children's theater group and later, as a young adult, went on to perform in the choruses of Broadway shows. She moved to California in 1974 and soon became active in the theater community there, as well as establishing a presence as a stand-up comedian. Eventually she developed The Spook Show, a one-woman stage show noted for its humor, satire, and drama, which she performed throughout the United States and Europe. That performance became the basis for the critically acclaimed Broadway show Whoopi Goldberg, which debuted in 1984. And in 1985 Goldberg won a Grammy Award for the show's recording. Soon afterward she made her Hollywood debut in The Color Purple, 1985, for which she garnered an Oscar nomination and a Golden Globe Award. Goldberg went on to perform in less successful films before appearing in Ghost, 1990, for which she won both the Academy Award and the Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actress. Goldberg followed up with numerous performances in film and television, including hosting her own talk show for a brief stint, serving as host of the Academy Awards show on several occasions, and starring in the television show Whoopi, 2003-04. In 2007 she became a co-host on the daytime television talk show The View. While noted for her liberal views, Goldberg served as the moderator during the program's frequent debates. Goldberg's other credits included the TV documentary movie Beyond Tara, The Extraordinary Life of Hattie McDaniel, 2001. As the host, 
She won a Daytime Emmy when it was named Outstanding Special Class Special in 2002. Later that year she also won a Tony Award for producing the Broadway show Thoroughly Modern Millie. With that win, Goldberg completed her EGOT. Although her planned Broadway revival of Ntozake Shames, 1975 ensemble theatre piece for colored girls who have considered suicide, when the rainbow is enough was cancelled in 2008. Goldberg played a religious zealot in the show's 2010 film adaptation, For Colored Girls. She later produced the musical Sister Act, 2011-12. Goldberg also acted on Broadway, appearing in solo shows as well as Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, 2003, and Xanadu, 2008. And she guest starred on television, shows such as The Animated Robot Chicken and the musical comedy Glee. In 2014, she appeared as a news editor in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a film adaptation of the comic book series and television program, and as a sharp-tongued pharmacist in the small-town movie comedy Big Stone Gap. She later starred in the miniseries The Stand, 2020-21, an adaptation of a Stephen King novel. In addition, Goldberg narrated the true crime docuseries The Con, 2020. Her other film credits during this time included the drama 9-11, 2017, which centers on a group of people trapped in a World Trade Center elevator during the September 11, 2001, attacks, and the comedy Nobody's Fool, 2018, wherein she played the mother of a recently paroled ex-convict, played by Tiffany Haddish. Goldberg was an activist on behalf of several causes, including human rights, AIDS research, and children's issues. Having acted in over 150 films, Goldberg is one of the 17 people to achieve the EGOT, having won the four major American awards for professional entertainers, an Emmy Television, a Grammy of Music, an Oscar Film, and a Tony of Theatre. She is the first black woman to have achieved all four awards. Goldberg has received two Academy Award nominations, for The Color Purple and Ghost, winning for Ghost. She is the first African-American actor to have received Academy Award nominations for both Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress. She has received three Golden Globe nominations, winning two, Best Actress in 1986 for The Color Purple, and Best Supporting Actress in 1991 for Ghost. For Ghost, she also won a BAFTA Award for Best Actress in a Supporting Role in 1991. She won a Grammy Award for Best Comedy Recording in 1985 for Whoopi Goldberg, direct from Broadway, becoming only the second solo woman performer, not part of a duo or team, at the time to receive the award, and the first African-American woman. The Views panel interview Barack Obama on July 29, 2010. In New York City protesting the 2008 California Proposition 8. Fifteen, Bessie Coleman, 1892 to 1926. Bessie Coleman, born January 26, 1892, Atlanta, Texas, U.S., died April 30, 1926, Jacksonville, Florida, was an American aviator and a star of early aviation exhibitions and air shows. One of 13 children Coleman grew up in Waxahachie, Texas, where her mathematical aptitude freed her from working in the cotton fields. She attended college in Langston, Oklahoma, briefly, before moving to Chicago, where she worked as a manicurist and restaurant manager, and became interested in the then new profession of aviation. Discrimination thwarted Coleman's attempts to enter aviation schools in the United States. Undaunted, she learned French, and in 1920 was accepted at the Cordron Brothers School of Aviation in Le Crotoy, France. She was the first African-American woman to hold a pilot license. She earned her license from the Federation Aeronautic International on June 15, 1921, and is the earliest known black person to earn an international pilot's license. Born to a family of sharecroppers in Texas, Coleman worked in the cotton fields at a young age, while also studying in a small segregated school. She attended one term of college at Langston University. Coleman developed an early interest in flying, but African Americans, Native Americans and women had no flight training opportunities in the United States. So she saved and obtained sponsorships in Chicago to go to France for flight school. She then became a high-profile pilot in notoriously dangerous air shows in the United States. She was popularly known as Queen Bess and Brave Bessie, and hoped to start a school for African-American flyers. Coleman died in a plane crash in 1926. Her pioneering role was an inspiration to early pilots and to the African-American and Native American communities. 
On April 30, 1926, Coleman was in Jacksonville, Florida. She had recently purchased a Curtis JN4, Jenny, in Dallas. Her mechanic and publicity agent, 24-year-old William D. Wills, flew the plane from Dallas in preparation for an air show and had to make three forced landings along the way because the plane had been so poorly maintained. Upon learning this, Coleman's friends and family did not consider the aircraft safe and implored her not to fly it, but she refused. On takeoff, Wills was flying the plane with Coleman in the other seat. She was planning a parachute jump for the next day, and was unharnessed, as she needed to look over the side to examine the terrain. About 10 minutes into the flight, the plane unexpectedly went into a dive and then a spin at 3,000 feet above the ground. Coleman was thrown from the plane at 2,000 feet, 610 meters, and was killed instantly when she hit the ground. Wills was unable to regain control of the plane, and it plummeted to the ground. He died upon impact. The plane exploded, bursting into flames. Although the wreckage of the plane was badly burned, it was later discovered that a wrench used to service the engine had jammed the controls. Coleman was 34 years old. A public library in Chicago was named in Coleman's honor, as are roads at O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. Oakland International Airport in California, Tampa International Airport in Florida, and at Germany's Frankfurt International Airport. A memorial plaque has been placed by the Chicago Cultural Center at the location of her former home, 41st and King Drive in Chicago, and it is a tradition for African-American aviators to drop flowers during flyovers of her grave at Lincoln Cemetery. A roundabout leading to Nice Airport in the south of France was named after Coleman in March 2016, and there are streets in Poitiers, and the 20th arrondissement of Paris, also named after her. In 2001, Coleman was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2006, Coleman was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame. In 2014, Coleman was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. On January 25, 2015, Orlando renamed West Washington Street to recognize the street's most accomplished resident. In 2023, Mattel added a Bessie Coleman Barbie doll to its Inspiring Women series. In 2023, The Flight, a play inspired by Bessie Coleman, debuted at the Factory Theatre, written and starring Beryl Bain. Coleman's aviation license issued on June 15, 1921. Coleman's grave at Lincoln Cemetery, near Chicago. In 2023 Coleman was honored in the American Women Quarters series. The 15th of June 21 is the date she was awarded her international pilot's license. U.S. Commemorative Stamp, 1995.